Okay, so uh, for the second exam, it, like I said in class, this is going to be very similar to our first exam. Uh, 25 questions, uh, probably about, oh, 35 to 40 percent qualitative, uh, about 60 percent, uh, I'm sorry, flip that, uh, about 60 percent qualitative, 40 percent quantitative. Uh, you will see some bond stuff on the exam, as well as some of the, the basic stock uh, valuation models that we covered in this class. And then we'll wrap up with some, uh, some of the stuff that we're doing this week in terms of measuring incremental cash flows, the coefficient of variation, and then how we use some other advanced techniques like sensitivity analysis and Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, but I, I guess, why don't, before I jump into any examples, why don't I open it up to you and see if there's any questions? Any takers? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> All right, let me do this step over here. All right, well, uh, let's go through this stuff one by one, and I'll, I'll walk through more or less what I'm thinking of or what I'm expecting you to know uh, for the exam. And when we come to quantitative uh, questions or questions where there could be a quantitative uh, problem, I'll likely, uh, I'll try to work as many as I can in the uh, time that I think is reasonable. All right, so uh, calculating bond prices. So this is one of the most basic things that uh, you should be able to do, especially since we've already talked about uh, how to calculate the the present value using the the time value of money buttons. So let's just create a a very quick example, and I will uh, work it here. Okay, so here's a, a question where I'm going to try and throw in everything I can possibly throw in, every trick that I would really reasonably throw at you on the exam. So you know the yield to maturity on a bond is 6.5% uh, compounded semi-annually. So we're going to have semi-annual coupon payments. Uh, the coupon rate is 4%. The bond matures in 10 years. What is the price of the bond? Okay, so let's, uh, before we actually use the VA2 calculator, let's uh, identify all the components that we have here. First off, the, I uh, will do the coupon, or rather the payment. All right, the payment, as we talked about all the way back in chapter six, the way we calculate that is by taking our coupon rate, so 0.04, times our, uh, times our face value, which will be a thousand. I'll mention that in a second uh, again. And then because we have semi-annual compounding, we divide that by two. And so our, our payment for this bond every six months is going to be $20. Next, I guess I should have started with this, but FV, face value, So our face value or par value, that for a bond is almost universally one thousand dollars. Just uh, if you don't see it, if you don't see the face value in the question itself, you can generally just go ahead and assume it, that it's a thousand dollars. I just wanted to leave it out of this question so I can mention it. Uh, all right, so that's that. Our n or number of periods is going to be just our years, so ten years times the number I've, of compounding periods per year, which in this case is two. So we have an N of 20 
And then we have an I divided by Y of, well, we have a yield to maturity of 6.5%. And we typically put our, our I divided by Y in percentage terms. So 6.5 divided by number of compounding periods per year. So in this case, our I divided by Y is 3.25. And now we can calculate the present value of our bond. So to do that, I'm going to try out some technology here. And uh, to get us started, I'll clear out our time value of money buttons and I'll start entering everything in that we need. Uh, so our payment is 20. Our base value is 1,000. Let's try that again. Okay. Payment is 20. Base value of 1,000. 3.25 is our I divided by Y. And our N is 20 as well. And we will compute our present value. And we find that to be, oh, about negative 18.26. And so obviously, I know I've said a dozen times in this class, that means it's a cash outflow from our perspective. So there we go. That's a, a bond question that uh, might mimic something you, you could see on the exam. OK, uh, differences between bonds and stocks. Well, uh, all I'm expecting you to know how to do is identify a couple of uh, key differences between bonds and stocks. So obviously, stocks don't have to pay dividends, bonds, some of them pay coupon payments, others don't. So if you remember, we had the zero coupon bonds that don't pay coupons, uh, and those are sold at a discount, uh, discount basis. Uh, bonds, you're required to meet every payment, and if you're, you don't pay off your, your creditors, so if you don't meet your coupon payment as a bond issuer or the face value, you're technically in default. Stocks, I mean, quite frankly, you don't default on a stock. Uh, stock doesn't guarantee a shareholder a specific level of income at all. All right, next, factors affecting the yield to maturity. All right, there's a couple of factors that affect the yield to maturity. First off, we have the uh, maturity risk premium. So uh, typically, the, the longer the time between now and maturity of a bond, the, the greater the likelihood that that uh, issuer of that bond will default on that bond. So typically, in normal periods, the uh, there's a positive relationship there. Uh, so the longer the time to maturity, the greater the maturity risk premium. Another factor that would increase the yield to maturity is interest rates. So the higher the interest rate, the higher the yield you're going to demand on a bond because, well, quite frankly, interest rates are higher. Your reserve is a lot higher. You could go somewhere else and get another interest rate at potentially, or another uh, buy another bond at potentially a higher interest rate. If interest rates rise, you should, as a bond uh, investor, demand a higher return. Another factor affecting the yield to maturity is inflation. So as inflation rises, you as a bond investor should demand a higher return to essentially guarantee you a, a real uh, return. And finally, I mean, an, one final component to the yield to maturity would be the default risk premium. So the greater the likelihood of default, the higher the yield should be on that bond. Okay, uh, next, what are some characteristics of each money market security discussed? Uh, quite frankly, we talked about about six or seven of these from CDs to uh, commercial paper to money market mutual funds. Uh, I'll probably, if I ask you a question on this, just stick to the big important stuff related to each, uh, each type of asset. And so if you just want to try and remember the, the basics of each, that'll, that'll almost certainly be fine. So commercial paper is the short-term debt of publicly, uh, of uh, uh, private companies, uh, money market mutual funds, these are mutual funds or portfolios of short-term assets. CDs, these are issued by banks and they lock up your money for a certain amount of money so that the bank can invest that money. 
uh, and earn a higher interest rate than they pay you as the, the buyer of the CD. Uh, so yeah, uh, basically know at least one characteristic about each of those, those money market securities. Next, what is the Fed funds rate and how is it calculated? So the Fed's, Fed funds rate is the rate that banks borrow from uh, each other and the Fed overnight. Uh, so it represents the lowest interest rate in the US economy. And there's two types of Fed rates. We have the, uh, the estimated and then we have the effective uh, Fed funds rate. So I guess the effective is generally called the target Fed funds rate. So uh, the target Fed funds rate is set by the Federal Reserve uh, board. Every time it meets, it'll determine what the ideal rate that banks should be borrowing at is. And then to adjust the Fed funds rate, the Fed will buy uh, bonds, so usually treasury securities, or they'll sell treasury securities to influence the, uh, the Fed funds rate upward or downward. So I, I believe I showed you that, that uh, chart several times in class, so you might want to review that. All right, next, what is LIBOR and how does it relate to the TED spread? Well, uh, LIBOR is our London interbank offered rate, and it represents the rate that banks think that they can borrow from each other overnight in uh, the city of London. And uh, typically, the during periods where banks face a lot of economic uncertainty, that's where they start to charge each other a higher rate. And so the reason this is important, and I thought I'd pull up the graphic here just for a second, just to refresh you. The reason this is important is because during periods of uh, great market uncertainty, the LIBOR will, will be very high. And the reason this is important is because uh, the the Fed funds rate or the uh, uh, the the other component of sorry the the other component of the, the LIBOR is the three month T bill rate or a, a T bill rate with a or a Treasury bill with a corresponding maturity and so uh, the TED spread is one of our most important measures of market uncertainty and so typically uh, what will happen during periods of market uncertainty is that the LIBOR rate will rise because banks are not willing or as willing to lend to each other, but the T-bill rate will shrink because investors want to hold that, hold that very, very low risk security. And so what ends up happening is this. Uh, during periods of market uncertainty, the TED spread will rise. And during periods of low market uncertainty, that's when it will fall. So notice here during the, the height of the coronavirus outbreak, the TED spread was very big. If we go back a couple of years to uh, the financial crisis, we would find that that would have been true during the financial crisis as well. So again, large TED spread during uh, these recessionary periods, which are in gray. OK, so that's that. Uh, what is the maturity risk premium, and how does it work? Well, the maturity risk premium is literally just the premium that uh, investors demand for holding securities that have a longer time to maturity. Basically, the longer the time to maturity, the higher the yield you should demand as an investor because the, the issuer could default or is more likely to, to default, say, in 10 years than tomorrow. Okay, next, municipal bonds and other bond yields. Okay, so municipal bonds, these, there's really one thing that you should remember about municipal bonds more so than anything else. And that is that unlike corporate bonds, municipal bonds, bonds issued by uh, state governments and local governments like the, the government of Muncie or the, uh, the government of the state of Indiana, when those parties issue a bond, it's a municipal bond. And municipal bonds, any coupon payments or any interest income that you as an investor receive when you hold those bonds is tax exempt, meaning you don't have to pay taxes on it. The reason this is important is because of this formula that I've highlighted. But essentially, uh, municipal bonds with the same risk will have a lower 
pre-tax yield to maturity than corporate bonds. But once you take into account the fact that you don't have to pay taxes on that municipal bond, uh, that's then your after-tax yield will often be comparable between the, the municipal bond and the, the corporate bond. So let me just give you a very, very quick example. So here, So here's a, an example that I might reasonably throw at you on, on the exam. So uh, you can invest in either of these two bonds. What is your after-tax yield on these bonds? We know that the pre-tax yield is 5%, but only one of these bonds, the corporate bond, is going to uh, require you or are you going to be required to, if you buy that bond, to pay taxes on any gains on that bond. So. So our yield on the corporate bond would be 5% times 1 minus our tax rate, 4.22, or 3.9%. Our municipal bond rate is literally just the, uh, the pre-tax yield. With municipal bonds, the pre-tax yield is equal to the after-tax yield. That's the really the one thing you should remember uh, about municipal bonds more than anything else. All right, next, what is a bond indenture agreement and what are covenants? Okay, so bond indenture agreement is literally it's it's the agreement where a where the issuer of a bond uh, describes exactly what their obligations to their bondholders are. So they're going to specify, specify things like the coupon rate, uh, the size of the issuance, the uh, face value of the bond, any call provisions or put provisions that would be associated with that bond. Basically anything that would be of significance to a bond investor will be in this bond indenture agreement. Uh, so along with that are going to be what we call protective covenants or just covenants for short. And covenants, these are essentially stipulations in the bond agreement itself that say what the, what the issuer is prevented from doing or required to do. So one of the most common bond covenants would be uh, the fact that the, the issuer would not be allowed to issue dividends while that bond is outstanding. So the reason this is important is because uh, if uh, this, this issuer issues a bond to raise cash and then immediately takes that $1 billion in cash that it raised from the bonds and issues that out as a dividend to shareholders, that's something that bondholders really don't like happening because it increases the likelihood that they'll never actually uh, get the, the face value plus the coupon payments that they were they agreed to receive when they when they bought this bond. So covenants prevent uh, the, the, the issuing company or the issuing organization from taking some actions that are detrimental to the bondholder. Okay, senior versus uh, junior versus secured bonds. So there, I mean, I, I know I said this in class, but we could literally spend an entire class or an entire semester on bonds. I think at Mizzou, they actually do offer a full bond class, but uh, basically there's I mean, there's, there's more bond issuances out there than there are stock issuances. Uh, and some of the various characteristics of these, these bonds relate to the, uh, the order in the bankruptcy hierarchy. So senior bonds are bonds where the, the bond holder, in the case of the issuer's default, the senior bondholders get paid what they're owed first. Junior bondholders, they get what's left. Uh, so if the senior bondholders, after the company defaults, uh, they receive everything that they were entitled to, 
then the junior holders, the junior bondholders get uh, what they're owed uh, for owning their bonds. And then usually anything residual will be paid to the, the shareholders, the stockholders. Secured bonds are, I mean, they're even more, even higher in the bankruptcy hierarchy than senior bonds. Basically secured bonds are bonds that are backed by some asset of the firm. So these could, this could be some piece of property uh, that the firm owns. It could be some accounts receivable. Uh, so in the case of default, the, se the secured bondholders are entitled to the firm's accounts receivable uh, during the period of default until that, that bond is paid off. Uh, so basically in the bankruptcy hierarchy, it goes secured, senior, junior bonds, and then shareholders down here. Uh, next, we already did just calculate the yield to maturity. So why don't I just move on to the yield to call and the current yield. And I'll do that by expanding my first example. So actually I'll, I'll write a new example. So here's something that you could reasonably see on uh, the, the exam. So I've given you enough information to get the yield to call, the yield to maturity, and the current yield. So let's start off with the yield to maturity. All right, so yield to maturity, first off, we know the present value. We paid negative 945.55. Remember, cash outflow, negative. Uh, next, our face value for this is going to be $1,000. And our N, in the case of yield to maturity, is going to be four years times two semi-annual payments. And the last part is the payment. Our payment is just our uh, coupon rate of 10%, 0.1, times our base value, divided by our number of coupon payments per year, so 50. So our I divided by Y, or rather I'll just put our yield to maturity here is just going to be, uh, clear this out and we'll get this. Oh, did I not put foolish? All right, uh, so our I divided by Y here is 5.87, uh, but keep in mind, this is a semi-annual interest rate, which means we need to multiply this by two to get our nominal uh, interest rate. So in this case, our yield to maturity is 11.74%. All right, next, our yield to call, uh, the way we get that is by changing only like two things. So I'll start off with this stuff down. And what we're going to change are really just the, the face value and our number of payments. So if we call this bond, or if the issuer calls this bond, they're buying it back from the bondholders in two years, or no earlier than two years from now, 
for $978. So $978 would be the face value, the new face value, and N would be two years times two payments, so four. And now we just use the time value of money buttons to recalculate the, the yield to call. So here our face value would be 978. We still have a payment of 50. We have a cash outflow of 945.55 negative. And N of four, compute our I divided by Y, that's gonna be 6.07. And rem remember that's our semi-annual uh, yield. So we need to multiply that by two to get an annualized yield. And that's gonna give us 12.14. All right, so that's that, that's our yield to call. So here, uh, obviously, since the yield to call is higher than the yield to maturity, from the issuer's perspective, there's no way that uh, they would want to uh, call this bond early because they'd be having to pay a higher interest rate to the, the, ship, to the bondholders. Okay, the last thing that we're looking for here is the coupon or the current yield. And the current yield, is just our total coupon payments per year divided by the price. And we know that our price is 945.55. And we know that our total uh, payments per year is just our coupon rate times our face value. So if we buy this bond, this is how much $100 we get every single year as a bondholder. So current yield is just 100 divided by 945.55 or about 10.6%. So there we go. Okay, wow, moving right along. Okay, uh, next, junk bonds and investment grade bonds. Okay, so the best thing I can do is uh, show you the S&P and Moody's uh, bond rate. So you should definitely know what a junk bond is and what an investment grade bond is and uh, what that means for the bond and the bondholders. Right? So the green levels here, these are investment grade. These are bonds where a bond rating agency like Moody's or Standard & Poor's or Fitch or maybe a smaller rating agency has come in and assessed the credit risk of each of this bond and they've assigned it a letter grade. So AAA means that the uh, bond issuer is very unlikely to default on their obligations to the bondholders. And so typically those bonds are seen as less risky and they come with a lower interest rate. And so we have a number of different bond ratings, but the lowest investment grade rating is triple B for S&P or BAA or BAA for Moody's. Once you go below this, this line, now you're in the, the quote unquote junk bond ratings or non-investment grade status. And this is where your interest rates on your bonds start to get very high. Uh, generally anything below triple C is essentially seen as almost guaranteed to default. I mean, I think D, I mean, Moody's doesn't even have D. And standard of pours, basically that just means you're, you're days away from a certain default. So that's the, the bond rating. Uh, the lower it is, the higher the interest rate. Next, what is a call provision? Okay, so I kind of touched on it with this example, uh, but a call provision is a characteristic in a bond that's identified in the bond indenture agreement. It essentially says that the bond issuer has the right to pay the bond off early. Now, the reason this is important is because if interest rates fall between the time when the bond issuer issues the bonds and the uh, two years from now, when it can start to call the bonds, then it's in the bond issuer's best interest 
issue new bonds at a lower interest rate and use that, that uh, capital that it raised to pay off its old bonds. And what that will do or the effect that that will have is to lower the firm's interest rate or the, the amount that it has to pay out to its creditors. So most corporate bonds in the United States are gonna come with call provisions. I mean, that's just, that's just good business sense. It gives you a chance to decrease the, uh, your cost of debt. All right, what are premium and discount bonds? So premium bonds are bonds with a, a current price above 1,000. So premium bonds are just bonds where the base value is below the present value of the bond. Discount bonds, these are bonds where the uh, price is below the, uh, the face value. So here's a, I mean, I, I've always liked this chart to illustrate this, but this is what happens to the, pr the price or the present value of bonds as they get closer to maturity. For premium bonds, you start out up here. So the price will fall, fall, fall all the way to the face value by the maturity date. With discount bonds, the price will rise all the way up until maturity. So you have two different paths. And depending on whether a bond is a premium bond or a discount bond, uh, that's what's going to determine its path toward the present value equaling the, the face value. All right, so the final, oh, and uh, also uh, note what I have here, premium bonds, are characterized by a coupon rate greater than the yield to maturity. So if you see a bond with a coupon rate above uh, its yield to maturity, definitionally you're going to have a premium bond. On the flip side, if the coupon rate, let's say it's 8% and the yield to maturity is 12%, now you're looking at a discount bond. Basically, uh, the value of that bond will appreciate over time as we get closer to maturity. So I guess that's. All right, the, the final point I want you to know, and this is arguably one of the most important things uh, that I discussed with the, the chapter six material, uh, the relationship between yield and bond prices is inverse. The higher the yield on a bond, the lower the price. So let me just show you, I, I drew out some stuff in Excel a while back and I, I like showing this because I think it pretty well illustrates what I'm talking about, but notice, as the yield to maturity increases, the price of the bond, the present value of the bond will fall. And this is, I mean, this is, if there is one thing that you should know about uh, bonds, it's that. It's that you know, yield and price are inversely uh, related. Uh, and then these different lines, these indicate uh, bonds with different coupon rates. Okay, so that's what I have for the chapter six material. Uh, Obviously, feel free to ask questions. I mean, I'd be, I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions if you have it. I mean, just feel free to shout it out. I, I always feel like I'm monologuing uh, during during lectures when I cover bonds, mostly because I, I think uh, bonds are not anyone's favorite topic. <laughs> but uh, okay, well, if, if there's no questions, why don't we uh, why don't we go ahead and move on? Okay, so uh, chapter seven was all about stock. Uh, we start off with preferred stock and we talk about the one or two main characteristics that are associated with it. And then we start to talk about uh, common stock, which is what you're probably way more familiar with uh, just in, in the public sphere. All right, so preferred stock, preferred stock is a hybrid between a bond and common stock. And preferred stock, the thing that you should know about it more than anything is that it pays a coupon and it that coupon payment does not change. I mean, that coupon payment is essentially, it's, it's a dividend, but it doesn't grow. And the only thing that a firm can do to, uh, if it wants to avoid paying that dividend is they can suspend the dividend on the preferred stock, but before they can pay common stockholders a dividend, they have to pay all of the preferred dividends or the preferred stockholders' dividends first. So essentially, defaulting on the dividend 
for a, a share of preferred stock will not lead to bankruptcy. But I mean, quite frankly, it, it also, you eventually have to uh, pay that out if you ever want to be able to pay dividends on your common stock as, as a company. Other characteristics about pr preferred stock you should know is that, I mean, there's no maturity on these things and there's also no voting rights. So if you own a share of preferred stock, you will never get a say in the, the uh, actions that the board or the management team undertake. Okay, so sorry, I'm getting a little thirsty. And I just sipped coffee, that should help. Okay, uh, next, what are some characteristics of common stock? Okay, common stock, definitely there's, there's a large number of things that you should know about common stock. First, the issuer of the common stock is not required to pay dividends, hands down. Again, there's no maturity, so it's, it's similar to a preferred stock in that respect. It is the very last in the bankruptcy hierarchy. You get what's left, and this is why common stock is commonly uh, thought of as uh, residual ownership. You get whatever cash flows, whatever assets are left in the case of bankruptcy once everyone else has been paid what they're owed. And then the big benefit of common stock is this. It gives you voting rights. It allows you to vote in the annual shareholder meeting and you get a say in who are the members of the board and does the firm undertake some uh, big actions. So does it accept a merger offer? Does it increase the executive pay? Uh, a lot of those big decisions will be made in the annual shareholder meeting. And so that's, that's why common stock is so valuable. So that's that. Okay, some other things you should know about common stock. Uh, the biggest thing here is that there are some cases where a company will have what are called classified shares or dual class shares of stock, meaning that it has two different share classes and those share classes will come with different ownership rights. So a good example of this is Facebook. Facebook has class A and class B shares. Uh, so if you own one class of shares, like I do, and like most shareholders of uh, Facebook do, you have one, you're entitled to one vote. And you also get uh, potentially any cash flows of the, of the company. Uh, however, there, there is another class of stock that is owned by mostly Mark Zuckerberg, and that gives you significantly more voting rights. So this is how Mark Zuckerberg, even though he only owns about 30% you know, of the shares outstanding, is able to retain the majority voting rights of Facebook because he owns the, this other special class of shares. And if he's not giving it up, he retains complete control of the board and the CEO and the management team, which obviously he's a part of. Okay, uh, next, what is an ADR? An ADR is an American depository receipt. And these things are pretty important because this is primarily how foreign companies trade their shares or have their shares traded in the US stock market. So uh, I, I know I gave you the example of Alibaba in class. Well, Alibaba is a Chinese company. It's, I mean, if you wanna think of it as the Chinese version of Amazon, that'd probably be the most accurate uh, comparison that I could give you. Uh, its shares trade on the New York Stock Exchange, or rather its ADR trades on the New York Stock Exchange. So the ADR is created by a bank, and that bank, it's buying up shares of the, uh, the company's stock in the foreign market, and it's issuing U.S. shares that are backed by those foreign shares in a certain ratio. So if you buy shares of the ADR, you're buying uh, essentially something that's backed by the, the shares of the stock in the foreign market. Okay, next, uh, what risks do you face when investing in international stocks? The two big risks that we face in international investment that we don't normally face uh, to the same degree in the U.S. are currency risk and political risk. So currency risk or exchange rate risk, 
this is the risk that during the period when you're investing in some foreign asset, there's going to be a change in the exchange rate between the dollar and whatever that, that local currency is. So when you convert your, uh, your foreign currency back into dollars, there's a possibility that that currency became less valuable relative to the dollar. And so your, your real return, once you convert it back into dollars, will actually be lower than uh, it would otherwise if there was no uh, exchange rate issue or change in exchange rate. The other risk is political risk. And this is the risk of, uh, say, a change of uh, regulation or, say, a change in political regime or something like that, something in the political sphere uh, associated with a company, uh, a country that affects your firm's uh, profitability and uh, cash flows. So I, I gave you a couple of examples in class. I mean, I think I mentioned uh, Zimbabwe and the nationalization that uh, that was used in Zimbabwe in uh, several several years ago. So uh, Zimbabwe, it was announced that they were taking over land that was owned by certain citizens, and those citizens had no recourse in in court. So basically. Uh, that is a risk of a lot of emerging markets that you could have your assets taken or your company's assets taken with very little recourse. So that's an example of a political risk. Okay, so that's that. Next, uh, when should you invest in a stock? Uh, well, quite frankly, there's generally you do that when the uh, market price is below the intrinsic value. And we calculate the intrinsic value using one of a handful of models. So let's just go through these. All right, so here's an example of a, a perpetuity formula question. So a stock has free cash flow of $2 a share. Uh, the required return is 14%. Uh, when I say the required return, what I mean is that is the return that you as the investor are demanding before you will buy those shares of stock. Uh, this is, I mean, the required return that's what we calculate when we calc when we use the cap m but I'll, I'll discuss that in a few minutes uh, all right cash flows are not growing so here the intrinsic value when we have no growth is literally just calculated using the perpetuity formula and the formula for that is just our free cash flows or dividends divided by our required rate of return so 4.4 that's our intrinsic value, $14.29. Okay. All right, let's try another question where we have a the cash flows growing at a constant rate. So here, with a constant growth in our cash flows, the model that we want to use is the Gordon growth model or it's sometimes referred to as the, uh, the dividend growth model. But you know we're not always using dividends and everyone recognizes the name, the Gordon growth model. So that's, that's what I'm going to call it. Okay, so our intrinsic value in this case where we have constantly growing cash flows is going to be our dividend today. So $2 times one plus our growth rate 0.05 divided by our discount rate of 0.14 minus our growth rate. And so when we have growing cash flows, our intrinsic value is $23.33. 
And notice that when we had no growth, it was only $14.29. So obviously it's valuable when we see the cash flows growing. Okay, uh, the final case we have occurs when we have, uh, I mean, unevenly growing cash flows. So we have essentially uneven cash flows. We have a $2 uh, cash flow today, then a $5, then a $10, and then uh, our final liquidating cash flow will be an $8 cash flow. What is the intrinsic value? Okay, so here, I mean, what we need to do is we need to discount these cash flows back to the present. And this is where I recommend that you bust out the, the BA2 calculator. and we'll get started. So our cash flow initially is $2. Okay. So our CF0 is two, with the down arrow. Our C01 is going to be five, enter. Our F01 is one. Our C02 is 10. Our F01, our frequency is one. Our C03 is uh, eight. F03 is one and we're done. Okay, so next we hit our NPV and we set our interest rate. And here it's 14%, so 14, hit enter, hit the down arrow, and then we hit compute. And that'll give us our NPV or rather the intrinsic value of this, uh, this asset. So $19.48. So this would be a case of super normal growth. So that's that. Uh, one other thing that you should be able to do is calculate the required return. And that is going to be calculated using the CAFM. Well, I guess we'll come to that. Uh, actually, I, I know I'm going to touch on that in a few seconds, so I'll, I'll put this one by the wayside. Basically, we use the, the CAPM to calculate the required return. Uh, the last thing that you should know in this chapter is uh, the PE ratio. The reason we care so much about the PE ratio uh, in the real world is because it tells us how much each dollar of current earnings should be worth. The higher the PE ratio, the more valuable the firm, the more investors are willing to pay for uh, a dollar of that firm's uh, current earnings. So for example, if a firm like Netflix has a PE ratio of 100 and uh, let's say Toyota has a PE ratio of 10, Netflix would be the more valuable company because investors have bid up the, the price uh, much higher relative to a dollar of EPS or earnings per share. Okay, chapter eight, that's where we start to look at portfolio analysis and building portfolios. Uh, you should absolutely be able to calculate the return on a stock. So Okay, so I'll just use a holding period return formula because it forces us to uh, use, uh, know both formulas. So our return here, or rather our holding period return is just the price at the end, so 350, 
minus our price that we bought the stock for, so $5, plus any dividends, so in this case, 50 cents, all divided by the price at the beginning, $5. And so there, we have a return of negative 20%. So there we go, pretty straightforward. I can guarantee you, you will absolutely have a return question on the exam. Right, next, calculate the weighted average portfolio return. Okay, pretty straightforward. All right, so here's an example. Uh, let's say you have these three stocks and they have these returns and these weights in your portfolio. So uh, stock C represents about two thirds of the total value of your portfolio at the beginning of the period. So how do we calculate the portfolio return or the weighted average portfolio return? The way we do it is we just take our Weights times returns. And then we just sum up all of our weights times returns. So in this case, our weighted average portfolio return is 1.3%. Uh, can you calculate the volatility? on a stock. Okay, fair enough. Uh, odds of a question like this on the exam, probably pretty low, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and work it. Uh, so let me just change things up. Okay, so let's say we have something like this, where okay, where we want to calculate volatility, or the, as it's often known, the standard deviation of the stock. All right, so first things first, we need to calculate the uh, mean of this stock's returns. And we're going to use that afterwards. So first off, we get our probability of this state of the economy occurring times the return plus the probability of the other state of the economy occurring times its return. So 8%, I'll put 8% here too. So that's our mean. Next, we want to calculate the uh, return in state A, I probably should, or state one, I should probably just number these. The return for state one of the economy, and that's just going to be return minus mean. And for this one, it's return minus mean. Then we square it. And then finally, uh, second to last, sorry, the uh, penultimate step is just to take our probability times the uh, squared deviations from the mean. So just take our probability times the squared deviations from the mean.
we're going to, oh, going to sum that up. And our, that's going to be our variance. And then to get our standard deviation, we just take the square root of that. So there we go. So obviously a longer problem. Uh, you know, you might just make sure you know how to do one of those. Uh, and then standard deviation is also referred to as volatility. Okay, uh, next, what is the difference between firm specific and market risk? So the big difference between firm specific and market risk is in the factor that creates that risk. Uh, so firm specific risk, this would be our, our risk of something bad happening to the firm itself. So uh, the phone a firm is producing explodes at high altitude. That would be an example of a firm specific or unsystematic risk that affects only that firm or maybe it's uh, immediate suppliers or buyers. Obviously, it's going to affect you if you bought the phone. Market risk is the risk that affects all firms. And we have a couple of names for it. Market risk, systematic risk, non-diversifiable risk. As the name implies, this is the risk that you can't diversify away. I mean, you can't escape the cost of a hurricane. Uh, that's going to affect the entire economy if it's big enough. A coronavirus outbreak would also represent a market risk event because everybody gets affected in one way or another. Uh, the degree to which you're affected is going to vary slightly, but you can't outright uh, avoid it. Now, the reason this is important, the reason we care about these two types of risk is because uh, the total risk of a security, that's measured by the standard deviation. That's the volatility. We can break that down into the two components, the diversifiable firm risk in pink here, and then non-diversifiable market risk. And the reason this graph is important is because after a certain point, we stop caring so much if we have enough stocks in our portfolio about the firm specific risk. I mean, we've diversified our portfolio enough that one firm specific risk event will not tank the value of our portfolio. It won't destroy our portfolio. So what ends up happening when we diversify our portfolio is that we start to care a lot more about this non-diversifiable market risk because that's the majority of our total risk. So this is why beta is so important. What is beta? Well, beta is the quantification of market risk. It represents the, the actual value of market risk for the stock or a particular stock or a particular portfolio that you're holding. And I know we didn't calculate beta in this class. If you take the investments class, you'll actually go through and calculate beta. But basically, beta measures the stock's volatility relative to the market. Essentially, the higher the beta, the higher the amount of market risk associated with a particular firm. And this is, this is actually our, our formula for calculating the beta. It's just the covariance between the returns of the stock and the market divided by the variance of the market. Uh, and the higher it is, the riskier the stock is. Uh, you can have betas of less than one, and that indicates that the, the stock is less risky than average. Uh, you can have a beta of one indicating that the, the stock has exactly the same level of risk as the overall market. The beta of a T-bill is zero. The beta of the S&P 500 is one. And here's some recent examples of stock betas. So Google and Apple, they're pretty well diversified. They have betas close to one. GM is risky as a, an auto producer. Walmart is not risky at all because it, it produces uh, goods that everyone needs regardless of time period. Uh, companies that, let's say, produce goods or develop goods that uh, are very beneficial during down periods of the economy or bear markets will typically have very low betas or even negative betas. So 
Historically, gold has had a negative beta, although at the time that I pulled this data, it actually had a slightly positive. Okay, so I guess I kind of went, went through all of that. Uh, can you calculate a portfolio beta? Well, quite frankly, the way we calculate a portfolio beta is very similar to the way that we calculate a, a stock return or uh, a portfolio return. So if we have this example from earlier where we have three stocks with these returns and these weights, and these betas, we can calculate the weighted average beta. And that's just going to be just, I mean, literally just the weight of each asset in the portfolio times the beta of that asset plus next. Times the beta plus the weight of the third stock times Beta. And so here our weighted average beta is actually 0.618. Okay. Next, what is the market risk premium and do you understand the other components of CAFM? Okay, so if there is one certainty on this exam, it is that you are destined to get a CAFM question or two. So what are these components of the CAFM? Well, the CAPM is our primary, or it's our original model for predicting stock returns or the expected return on a stock, also known as the, the required return on the stock. Essentially, the CAPM, it, it specifies the relationship between uh, market risk of a stock and the return on that stock. Uh, so here's our formula for the CAPM. What we do is we take the firm's beta and the risk-free rate, which is always assumed to be a US T-bill or the yield on a treasury bill or a US treasury security, like a longer term T-bond. And we take that risk-free rate plus the beta times the market risk premium. Market risk premium is the amount by which we expect the, return, the market to outperform the risk-free rate. And we define the market as the S&P 500 uh, index in the US. So if we expect that the S&P 500 index will offer a 10% return this year, and the risk free or the yield on a T-bill will be 2%, our market risk premium will be 8%. So that's what we would plug in right here. Uh, the reason we call this the risk premium is because this is literally a premium for taking on the risk of uh, holding a a non uh, a non T bill, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, so the higher the beta, the higher your expected stock return or return on the stock. Uh, can you calculate the expected return of a stock? Well, hopefully. So let's let's just do one of those. Okay, so here's a CAPM example. Uh, obviously, you've probably read it, but we have a beta of 0.2. We know that the expected return on the market is 11%. And we know that the risk-free rate is 2.5%. So Um, 
So this means that our expected return on Walmart stock is going to be equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta times the market risk premium, which is the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. I'll close all of my parentheses. And Walmart's expected return is 4.2%, which I mean, given it's very low beta is very realistic. Yeah. All right, finally, what is the SML? Well, the SML is this line or the security market line. It literally just represents the relationship between an asset's beta on the x-axis and the expected return on that stock on the y-axis. So higher beta, means higher expected stock return. And here's the cap M down here. Okay, so that being said, uh, I hope I haven't lost too many people. Uh, do you guys have any questions so far? Let's see if I can pull that up, I think I... Okay, well, I'll, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> Just wanted to see how, how many people were, were still with me. <laughs> I, I'm glad there's still a few. Okay, uh, all right, let's see. Uh, chapter nine, uh, this is where we start the capital budgeting discussion. So what is capital budgeting? Capital budgeting is uh, the process by which we pick and invest in projects that add value to a firm. And we normally decide which projects to add based on a couple of different techniques, the ones that I'm highlighting right here. Uh, net present value, IRR, payback, discounted payback, modified IRR. Uh, but let, let's wait on that for a second. Uh, what is the difference between independent and mutually exclusive capital budgeting projects? Well, the big difference between these two is that if you're given a series of independent capital budgeting projects, you can, you can select any of them, as long as you have the, the capital to select any of them. Mutually exclusive capital budgeting projects are, budge are projects that you can only select one of. So I think in uh, class, I gave you the example of uh, two possible projects or buildings that you could build at one site. I mean, you can only build one building on a site. So if you build, you invest in one capital budgeting project where you build a factory, there, now you can't build a piece of commercial real estate there. Uh, so that would be an example of capital budgeting. All right. Next, why don't we go ahead and use all of these techniques in one example? And we'll throw in zero and we'll make that negative. Let's make that negative 1100. Okay. So here we go. Uh, let's start off by getting our uh, NPV. So the way to get your NPV of a project like this, where we have four years, four, four periods, is to use the cash flow button. Go to cash flow, clear that out. And first off, we have a cash flow at time period zero of 1100. Enter. Uh, cash flow one is 100. Cash flow two is 500. Cash flow three is 300. And cash flow four is 400. Next, we hit the NPV button and here we need to assign an interest rate. Uh, let's just say, our, our discount rate is 5%. 5% of 
5%, enter, hit down, hit compute, and our NPV in this case is 36.99%. So I'd be, or, sorry, uh, $36 and mistake, that is a number. So what this really says is that if we take on this project, uh, this project will add $36.99 of value to our company. Essentially, the incremental cash flows are $36.99 over the life of this project, discounted back to the present. Next, let's get our IRR, our internal rate of return. So now that you've got the cash flows entered here, all you have to do to get the IRR is just click the IRR button, hit compute, and there we go, 6.29%. Pretty easy. Next, let's get our payback period. And the way we calculate our payback period is by determining at what point we pay back the initial, we get paid back our initial investment. So in year one, it would just be, I mean, we've invested $1,100 and uh, we received a $100 cash flow. So we still have $1,000 to go. Next year, we received $500. So we still have 500 to go. Next year, we receive another $300. And so we still have two, uh, $200 to go. And notice here that in the final year, we receive $400 and we still have $200 to go. So what we do is we divide the, uh, the remaining cash flow, or rather the, the absolute value of the remaining cash flow by the, the amount that we receive in year four, in this case, $400. So our payback period is one, two, three and a half, three and a half years. So that's that. Next, we want our discounted payback period. And this involves us discounting all of these cash flows back to the present and then repeating the same process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to discount each cash flow by one plus the uh, discount rate to uh, whatever value or over the course of however many years. So in this case, one year. And there we go. Okay, so now what we can do is we can uh, actually repeat this same process. So in year one, We still owe a thousand dollars at the end. In year two, we still owe five hundred and fifty-one. In year three, we still owe two ninety-two, and uh, our remainder is just going to be the absolute value of this two ninety-two point one zero divided by our three twenty-nine. So here, our discounted payback is three years plus this 0.89, so 3.89 years. So that's that. The final method that we discussed was the uh, modified IRR. And what we do with this is we need to identify a uh, reinvestment rate. So here I'll say the, the reinvestment rate is 4%. The reason this is important is because 
Uh, what this reinvestment rate means is that once we receive this $100 cash flow and this $500 cash flow and this $300 cash flow, we're reinvesting that at, in some asset that earns 4% interest. So let's just create another column. So first one, we're taking, we're receiving this $100 cash flow and we are investing it for another three years at 4%. So just take one plus our reinvestment rate to the power of three. And this cash flow, we're reinvesting it at the same 4% rate for two years. This cash flow, we are receiving it uh, and then reinvesting it at 1.04. Don't even have to put this, but I will. And then finally, we have $400. All right, so the way we use the modified IRR is by using our time value of money buttons. We have these cash flows in this year. And what this really says is that. Uh, zoom out here. Our total cash flow, if it was reinvested at a 4% rate and all withdrawn in year four, would be $1,365.29. And so what we can do is we can use the BA2 calculator. And we can, first let me clear our time value of money buttons. We're going to take that 1365.29 and set that as our future value. Our present value is the initial cash flow of negative 1100. We have payments of zero and uh, N of four. And lastly, we compute our I divided by Y. So here, our investment or our, our interest rate, our yield would be 5.55 or 5.55%. So there we go. We just used all five of those techniques on the same problem. Okay, uh, next, what is the NPV decision rule? Pretty straightforward. Our NPV decision rule is basically invest in the project if it has a positive NPV. Uh, you would never invest in a project if it had a negative NPV. So here it is. Uh, NPV greater than zero means that the project will add value and it'll increase the wealth of the owners or the, the shareholders. Uh, how do we select? capital budgeting projects based on each capital budgeting technique. I mean, quite frankly, uh, if we go back to this example, we want a positive NPV and we're going to select the project if we have independent projects with the highest NPV. Uh, we, we also want an IRR that offers, that is the highest possible. Uh, but if we're choosing between these two, we're going to uh, focus more on the NPV or rely more heavily on it. And that's gonna be our, our primary criterion. Uh, payback period, we usually want to have a payback period that is uh, less than some, some hurdle year. So if we set a decision rule, we invest in the project, if we get paid back in under four years, this project would be uh, attainable. We, we might consider in investing in this project because we can recoup our cash in under three years. And even once we use the discounted payback method that we can still recoup our, our investment in under four years. Uh, modified IRR, again, it just gives us another interest rate or rate of return. Uh, so it, it works very similar to IRR. Okay, uh, what are the pros and cons of each capital budgeting technique? Uh, so let's go through these, these again. The big pros of the NPV is that, I mean, the big pro is that it has, we have a decision rule. 
we have a rule that tells us this project adds this much value and we select the project that offers the highest value. IRR, the big pro is that it actually gives us a uh, rate of return. And there are some drawbacks with it. Mainly if we had uh, changing cash flow signs, we could have different IRRs. We could have an IRR that's negative, an IRR that's positive. Uh, that could be a problem. Uh, payback period, I mean, this, this is only really useful in well, for, for short-term projects, I mean, we usually don't use this method for longer-term projects like uh, investing in uh, or building a building or uh, building a nuclear power plant or uh, developing or, let's say, raising some forest land to build, to uh, plant corn on. I mean, that, that would be a longer-term investment and uh, the payback period really wouldn't be applicable here. Okay, so that's that. Next, chapter 10. Okay, chapter 10, I know we haven't gone through all of it. I mean, I realize we have about two thirds left to go, but uh, there are some things that are more important than others. Uh, so when we talk about incremental cash flows, this is the stuff that we value in incremental cash flow. We wanna know what our side effects of our project are. You know, are we going to lose sales? from another product line because we're starting a new product line. So I gave you the example of, uh, I think chocolate versus chocolate ice cream that we sell versus a new product that we're starting to sell like Rocky Road. Yes, we might get some outside, some new customers, but we're probably cannibalizing our, our sales from some of our other product lines. When we talk about incremental cash flows, we wanna know the cash flows that we're adding on top of all of our other cash flows if we weren't taking on this product. So what are our new, uh, how many new buyers of our product are there and how much are they paying us? Next, changes in networking capital and fixed assets. I mean, essentially if we're investing in new networking capital or fixed assets, that's going to take away cash flow or free cash flow. In other words, uh, we're going to have to subtract out any changes in networking capital and any changes in fixed assets. We'll do that uh, tomorrow morning. Next, there's any tax effects. Let's say a project would decrease our taxes. Let's say we're engaging in an environmental project that would give us tax credits or our company tax credits that would reduce our, our tax liability. Uh, that would be a benefit to us. And then finally, opportunity costs. I mean, if we are investing in this project, but we could have invested in another project that would have offered uh, a, a large stream of cash flows, that opportunity cost has to be captured in our, our incremental cash flows because we wanna know how much value this project is adding relative to not investing in this project. There are some things that we don't value, the big one being uh, depreciation. So depreciation, as I mentioned in the last class, it's a non-cash expense. I mean, we subtract uh, we, we calculate depreciation and depreciation expense reduces our uh, gross income on the income statement. But because it's a non-cash expense, when we calculate our cash flows, we have to add that back in to get the, the actual amount of cash that this project has generated in a given period. And here's our formula. Uh, so I'm hoping you, you will be able to calculate earning uh, our free cash flow on the exam. I'll probably give you a very simple example related to this. So it's just our earnings before interest and taxes plus depreciation minus taxes, uh, minus any CapEx and minus any change in networking capital. So uh, actually I'll probably put this by the wayside because I intend to do several examples in class tomorrow. So, uh, can you calculate depreciation expense based on a depreciation schedule? Okay. Yeah. So let's say we we have a case where
say Let's say you have something like this, where you've, pop, you've bought a piece of equipment and it depreciates uh, using straight line depreciation over four years, one, two, three, four. And uh, eventually you sell the asset for $3,000 at the end of year three and your tax rate is 14%. What is your after tax salvage value? Okay, so uh, depreciation, uh, depreciating at a straight line uh, rate, what that means is that every year your depreciation is going to be $1,250. And at the end of each year, you're going to have a fair value associated with uh, this asset. So at the end of year one, the fair value of that asset or the, the, uh, the net value of this property, plant, and equipment will be $37.50. Next year, it'll be worth half of what it was at the start. And then finally, by the end of the period, it'll, it'll, the four years, it'll be worth zero. All right, so to calculate your your after-tax salvage value, you know that you're selling this for $3,000 at the end of the third year. So to calculate that uh, after-tax value to you, just be 3,000 minus your tax rate of 14% times the amount by which your salvage value, the amount you sold it for, is greater than the fair value. So any amount beyond that fair value, you have to pay tax on because that's a profit from your perspective. So here, it'd just be a uh, quantity of $3,000 minus $1,250. And so your after-tax salvage value will be uh, about $2,700 or $2,800. Okay. Uh, can you calculate depreciation expense based on a depreciation schedule. I kind of just snuck that in there. Basically, if you have a depreciation rate, uh, basically you're, you're just multiplying the uh, starting value of the asset by that depreciating, uh, that depreciation rate. So if it was a 25% depreciation rate, you just multiply the, the, the starting value of your asset by 25% and you'd get what I have here. Okay, uh, yeah, so we'll do this tomorrow where I'll give you a series of projects uh, that you could invest in and we'll talk about how you trade off NPV versus IRR uh, decisions. So uh, go ahead and take a look at the, the Euroland Foods uh, example that I, I put on our Canvas site. We'll talk about that in class. Uh, how do you estimate the required rate of return? Okay, so. There are two ways that we estimate your required rate of return on an asset. Pull it up because I, I know I haven't talked about it in class yet. Uh, but uh, the two ways that we determine this are these two that you see here, the pure play method and the risk adjusted discount rate method. Now the pure play method, this one is where we assume that the, uh, the beta that we're using to calculate our required rate of return will be approximated by some competitor of our firm. So if we're determining as a financial manager whether or not our firm should invest in, uh, let's say a piece of equipment that produces clothing. Well, we to calculate the required rate of return or the discount rate on this capital budgeting project, what we might do is go out and find a company that only uh, produces this equipment 
and determine what their beta is, and then plug that beta into the cap M. So for example, let's say we, uh, we've identified that our direct competitor that only produces, only uh, uses this type of equipment that we're considering investing in, uh, it has a beta of 0.8. What we would do is we would take our competitor's beta of 0.8, identify the market risk premium and the risk-free rate, and that'll get us the, the discount rate on this project that we're considering investing in. That's the pure play method. The risk-adjusted discount rate method, this is a little more, I don't want to say guesswork, but I mean, it, it is kind of guesswork. Basically, we take our firm's uh, required rate of return, our firm's discount rate based on the cap M. And let's say our, our firm's discount rate is, uh, let's say it's 10%. Well, if the project that we're considering investing in is riskier than the average project that our firm typically invests in, what we might decide to do is actually increase our discount rate from 10% to 14% to account for that additional risk. If the project that we're considering investing in is less risky than the average project that our firm invests in, then we might decrease our discount rate by uh, 4% to let's say 6%. So this, this risk adjusted discount rate, I mean, it, it's exactly what it sounds like. We adjust our discount rate based on our, the perceived riskiness of a given project. Okay, uh, what is forecasting risk? I mean, forecasting risk is literally, it's, it's the risk of uh, the sensitivity of NPV to changes in cash flow estimates. Basically, uh, what we do is we, we calculate the volatility of the, well, I, I shouldn't mention the coefficient of variation yet, but uh, basically there are some projects where it's going to be very difficult to estimate the cash flows to those projects. So these are going to be projects like investing in uh, R&D to develop a new drug. I mean, there's a good chance that this drug does not pass FDA muster. It doesn't pass drug trials. So our cash flows in a large prob in all probability are likely going to be uh, zero 10 years out. But there is a huge chance that, I mean, those cash flows could be very high and very positive. So uh, for some projects that are really risky, like uh, developing a new drug or investing in uh, or expanding into a new market, maybe an emerging market, that's gonna be a really risky project. And our goal with forecasting is to try to account for that risk. Now we use a number of techniques to account for that risk. I mean, uh, scenario analysis, sensitivity analysis, I'll show you Monte Carlo simulation on Friday and then real managerial options. Uh, let's start off with scenario analysis. Basically, we have, I mean, usually the standard is to have three cases. You put together a worst case in terms of your cash flows, a base case, the case that is most likely, and then a best case scenario. Just here's what could happen if all the things that are likely to go right go right. So you provide essentially NPVs and IRRs for all three cases, and that'll give you a sense of the, the range of possibilities or a likely range of possibilities. Uh, let's see. Uh, sensitivity analysis. This is a little more complicated. Basically, sensitivity analysis occurs when we, uh, we we essentially change one item in the input formula, and we see how that, that one change in our, in our model affects the NPV or the IRR of this, of uh, our project. So sensitivity analysis, we might look at a change in the GDP growth rate of the larger economy or a decrease in the sales revenue from the base case to our uh, another case where let's say we expected $100,000 in sales revenue. Well, what happens if on, we only have $50,000 in sales revenue? What happens to our NPV uh, in that case? Another technique that we use is Monte Carlo simulation. And this is a case where we, we run several thousands of simulations 
and we plot out the NPV or the IRR of a project, and you get something like this. And so this is something that I did, uh, as you can see, a while back. Uh, so I just plotted the, the expected return on Google stock. And uh, when you run Monte Carlo simulation, you're running, I mean, you're, I mean, I think I ran like 10,000 different simulations here. And uh, this will give you a, a visual, well, basically a visual of the, the expected NPV or the expected return or the expected IRR on a project. And then finally, real managerial options. These are cases, these are options that you can use to expand the project. So uh, the classic example might be if you, uh, okay, I'll, I'll give you an example that I don't have here, but uh, let's say that you are a financial manager and you believe that uh, there could be an opportunity to invest into the Brazilian market uh, and sell your soft drinks. Well, one thing you might do is enter into a strategic alliance with a Brazilian uh, company that already produces uh, soft drinks. So you might develop a new soft drink with them and sell it in the Brazilian market because your, your partner would likely know the Brazilian market better than you. And you have a better sense of, well, how to uh, develop a cost effective product and get it to market. So you're benefiting from. Uh, the, the skill of both yourself and your, your partner. Uh, the option comes in there when you, I mean, essentially you aren't investing outright in new production facilities, rather you're, you're uh, relying on your partner to, uh, to produce the product. Uh, but if you were to exercise the option and acquire your partner, just buy out the, the ownership stake of that company, that would be an example of exercising a real managerial option. Basically, you could have uh, invested more initially, but instead you only, you only made a, a token investment just to test out the market. And this is something that happens uh, all, the, I mean, all the time in the real world. So companies will uh, potentially take a toehold investment in a, a local partner and then if they think that there is a good chance to uh, you know, uh, make significant money, they might acquire a larger stake in their, their partner, or they might even uh, acquire a majority stake in their partner, or they might expand uh, production facilities in that new market. So uh, essentially what I'm trying to get at is managerial options are really just options that they're investments that give you the option to expand at a later date. Then finally, coefficient of variation here. Uh, this is going to be our, our standard deviation divided by our uh, expected return or expected NPV. So what we're doing here is we're developing a measure of the risk, a scaled measure of the risk of a project. So we have, uh, let's say, in the case where we have scenario analysis. We have a worst case, a base case, and a best case. We're gonna have three different NPVs here. And we can calculate the standard deviation of those NPVs divided by the expected NPV, and that'll give us our coefficient of variation. And that'll be a measure of risk that we can, uh, we can talk around in a meeting when we, we try to sell a project, a capital budgeting project to our superiors. All right, so there we go. I, uh, I kind of monologued there. Whew. Okay, so I hope you stuck with me. And uh, if you did, congratulations, kudos. Uh, that was a lot. Uh, does anyone listening have any questions for me? I mean, I'm obviously willing to answer any questions that you might have. Okay. Well, shoot, I, I guess we... Uh, we could just call it here. And uh, if you do have questions, obviously we still have two classes until the exam opens up. Uh, but until then, uh, feel free to reach out and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be available. So thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Take care.